if you are here today watching this, oh, you're blessed. You're blessed to be exposed to this kind of information today. Uh, not only are you blessed to be exposed to this kind of information, you're also blessed to partake in me beginning uh, what will be a long series of teachings that are connected. So now we are starting with the subject of the mystery of God. And then from the mystery of God, we're going to graduate into other subjects, which eventually lead us into the end time series. Um, I do realize that many believers, many Christians have not taken time to study the end times. Um, and due to this, there is a lot of misconception. There is a lot of fear. Whenever you discuss the rapture, the end times, the second coming of the Lord, people are apprehensive. They don't really want to uh, delve into such matters because they believe that you are discussing the interruption of their lives. And as such, I believe it's important to build a foundation of knowledge from a very basic place so you can begin to understand exactly what does it mean for the Lord to return? What does it mean for uh, the end times to be the end times and the world to come to an end? All these things need to be understood in context so that you don't have a big misconception about us being taken to heaven in white garments and a white big room, worshiping in the clouds forever and ever. That is just not the case. And uh, no, it is not also true that it will be boring or what will we be doing forever? All these questions that you may have uh, can be answered in the scriptures. But today we'll begin with the mystery of God because I believe that is where everything began. And that is also what will be the beginning of the end of all this. So it's important to understand that God is a mystery. I, I, I hope I have urged you to subscribe, to hit the bell and share. Very important information. One thing I must also mention is that Jesus said, if you receive a disciple in the name of a disciple, then you will receive a disciple's reward. If you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, then you will receive a prophet's reward. And in saying such, I would like to encourage you that the work being done here today, me sharing this word with you, can be participated in. You can partake in the reward for this work I'm doing here today by simply uh, sitting to listen, to participate, to receive the message, by sharing, by liking, by commenting. All these things that you do in form of engagement in this content would be a form of acceptance of this word and therefore you receive the reward that's appropriate. Together many forms that sing for me My heart beats when it could not sing a P 1G, bless some keys that sing for me I get hooked to the chorus guaranteed uh, I'm a tempo tempo Music takes you to the place it came from Instrumentals in your mental echoes In your subconscious it sits and set those
Alright, so we need to get into the scriptures now. Uh, a good place to start is to acknowledge that God is a mystery. And in acknowledging that God is a mystery, we are also acknowledging that there is need for this mystery to be revealed. And if there is need for the mystery to be revealed, then there is need for the revealer of the mystery. And we also know that in the kingdom of God, there are people that are qualified or there are individuals that are qualified to reveal specific mysteries, while there are also individuals that are not qualified to reveal certain mysteries. A good example of this would be the angel that appeared to Cornelius in the book of Acts. I will not show you this scripture because I'm just giving you an introduction to the subject. An angel appears to Cornelius in the book of Acts. Cornelius was a prayerful man and he gave alms but he did not know the Lord Jesus Christ. So the angel appears to him and tells him, go to Simon, who is called Peter, and he will tell you words by which you and your family can be saved. Now, the interesting thing is that the angel is coming from heaven. You would expect that this angel would be able to give Cornelius the words by which him and his family can be saved. But the angel urges Cornelius to go to a fellow man to be able to give him words by which he and his family can be saved. Uh, this tells us about qualification. Who is qualified to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? The gospel is for men. It is preached by men to men. The Bible also goes as far as telling us that angels long to look into these things because they do not necessarily understand the whole concept of salvation. Neither do they understand the mystery of godliness. And so in order for there to be a mystery, uh, or rather if there is the existence of a mystery, then the mystery needs to be revealed. And if there is need for uh, revelation of the mystery, then there is need for a revealer of the mystery. And if there is a revealer of the mystery, then we also understand that there are those that are not qualified to reveal such mystery. And a good example I have given you is the angel that was not able to give Cornelius the words by which he and his family can be saved, right? I can give you another example. Jesus Christ meets uh, demons within a man that he is about to cast out. And, they begin, and the demons begin to testify of who Jesus is. Oh, Jesus, thou son of God, that thou anointed one of God. And Jesus forbids them from giving a true testimony about him. This is also to show you that there are parties, entities from whom we cannot learn the mysteries of God. There are parties and entities with whom such a privilege has not been left to reveal the mysteries of God. And ladies and gentlemen, you and I here, have been given this mandate to not only search out the mysteries, but to reveal them. The Bible, says, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it is the honor of kings to search it out. So this honor has been given to us to search out these mysteries. If God was not a mystery, then we would need not to search out and reveal said mystery. And some of you may wonder, why do we really need to understand the mystery of God when one day we will see God and we will know even as we are known? I would like to answer that, but the answer would be quite long and I would not get into my, my subject for the day. Yeah, so I would really like to get into it. Hope you brought your shouting clothes tonight. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Now there are six things there that are said to describe the mystery of godliness. To start with, the, the scripture there says, without controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness. No matter how great they tell you the controversy was, it's without controversy that this mystery of godliness is. 
And then the mystery of godliness is further explained. This mystery of godliness that is without controversy is further explained to say, number one, God was manifested in the flesh. Number two, he was seen by angels. He was justified in the spirit. He was preached on among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. Now, let's begin to investigate those uh, items one by one. This mystery of godliness. Let us begin to identify and investigate them one by one, at least some of them. So the Bible says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. That is mysterious. Ladies and gentlemen, that is very mysterious. Just yesterday, I had a conversation with a young man about Christ being God. He said, how can Christ be God if he acknowledged that there was a God in heaven? I hope you're understanding the question that this, this gentleman was trying to ask. He was saying, how can Christ be God here on earth? God is here on earth in the flesh, while at the same time, God is in heaven. And Christ, being God here, is praying to God in heaven. How does this make sense? Help me make sense of this. Why do you say Christ is God if Christ was here and God was in heaven? How does this make sense? Now I'll read you a scripture in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 13. Jesus said, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. Now why did Jesus Christ say that he was in heaven? while being physically here on earth, talking to them like this, the way I'm talking to you. Jesus was talking to them, eyeball to eyeball, and telling them, no one has been to heaven except the Son of Man, who is in heaven. The Son of Man who was talking to them like this, eyeball to eyeball, began to tell them, no one has been to heaven except the Son of Man who came from heaven, who is in heaven. You see, there's a mystery there. When the Bible says God was manifested in the flesh, there's a mystery. There's a mystery in God that has not been known for ages that was revealed in Christ. The triune nature of God. The Bible says in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You see, the understanding that we saw uh, casually have, and we say, oh, Trinity, oh, Father, Son, Spirit, oh, Godhead. This is not, <laughs> this is valuable knowledge. This is a mystery that has been revealed in Christ. I'm talking about the angels did not understand this nature of God, the triune nature, the Godhead, that God is one, but three persons. This was revealed in Christ. Hallelujah. I told you, hope you brought your shouting clothes tonight. This is knowledge worth shouting over. So the Bible says God was manifested in the flesh. God was manifested in the flesh. So Christ was the manifestation of God in the flesh. The book of Hebrews talks about how Christ is the brightness of God's glory the express image of his person. So Christ is a physical appearance of the invisible God. And the Bible goes on to say, seen by angels. So without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, right? So God was manifested in the flesh, uh, which is Christ Jesus coming down to earth in the flesh, while also at the same time saying the son of man who is in heaven, because Christ and the Father are the same person, and justified in the Spirit, because Jesus always talked about how he cannot bear witness of himself, uh, neither can he accept the witness of men, but there is one who bears a true witness, and that is the Holy Ghost. So justified in the Spirit, seen by angels. This is another mystery. When we begin to investigate this, we realize that in the Bible, in the book of uh, uh, in the book of Luke chapter 1 verse 19, Gabriel begins to explain the angel saying, 
And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. Now, when you investigate this matter, this was Gabriel talking to uh, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, telling him about the birth of his son because God had sent him. Now, Gabriel here is saying, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. Yet the Bible is telling us that God was manifested in the flesh, seen by angels. I hope you're getting what I'm trying to say. God manifested in the flesh and everything else that follows is a mystery. So Christ is the mystery of God revealed. But there is the revealer of this mystery of God revealed who is known as the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the revealer of the mystery of God in Christ. Now, I know I may have started from what seems to be a complicated place, but I'm getting somewhere. I'm trying to get you to understand the focus of the mystery. You see, the problem is, if we begin to discuss the mysteries that are in God, and we begin to focus on angels or other worlds, or we begin to focus on the abilities that human beings have, we begin to focus on the cherubim and the seraphim and the orphanim. They have a place in the kingdom of God, but they are not the focus. Remember the Bible in the book of Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, focus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, because Jesus is the summation of the mystery of God. Therefore, I'm trying to reveal to you, expose you, before we begin to delve into this mystery and reveal it, we need to understand what the focus of the mystery is. That, oh, wait, God is a mystery. But this mystery of God has been revealed in Christ. This is why the Bible in the book of 1 Timothy 3.16 tells us that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And then goes on to list to us what this mystery of godliness is. That God was manifested in the flesh, seen by angels, justified in the spirit, preached on in the world, believed, uh, uh, preached on unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. This is the mystery of God, hidden in God, revealed in Christ. The Bible says also of Christ in the book of Colossians that in him dwell all the treasures of knowledge and wisdom. So whatever you want to know that has been hidden in God is revealed in Christ. But if there is a revelation of a mystery, then there must be a revealer of this mystery. So God is the mystery, Christ is the revelation, and the Spirit is the revealer of the revelation. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from darkness, from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Okay, this is a very interesting, a very powerful, a very informative portion of scripture. Genesis chapter 1 from verse 1 to 5, talking about God reassembling a creation he had already made. Now I'm talking about God reassembling a creation he had already made because uh, the Bible tells us that the earth was, okay? Before we go into the state of what the earth was, formless and void, it first says the earth was. So we are not talking about God creating earth. God already did that. But we're talking about God putting into order an earth that was. What was it? Formless and void. So remember, the Bible says, for example, in the book of Hebrews, he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those that diligently seek him. So the state of being, he is. The state of being of the earth was. Okay? So the earth was without form and void. And darkness, <laughs> darkness was on the face of the deep. I would like you to understand something. 
God does not necessarily need you to turn on the light in a room for him to see the contents of the room. Uh, that is not how God operates. God does not need you to turn on the light. He's not in, in need of, of your electricity and your, your solar <laughs> and your sun and your bulbs. And that's, that's just not how God operates. God is light. He is the one that can see even the things that are hidden in darkness. If you talk about God's ability to see, ah, that's a whole subject. That's a whole subject. God's ability to see is a whole subject. So when we talk about God describing something as darkness, it is not because he is unable to see. So some might assume that, oh, God was saying, let there be light because he needed to see before he creates. How was God going to see? Okay, what was the light shining on? Let there be light where? When you enter into a room and you switch on the light, so many lights in this room right now, but you enter the room and you switch on the light, are you able to really identify the light as it consumes the darkness? Are you able to see that process? Are you able to see the darkness running away or hiding in some corner somewhere? Uh, I'll tell you the truth. There may be some dark spots in the room after you turn on the light, but the truth is that the dark spots only exist because there is a blockage that has been created, a wardrobe, or there is something that has been put in the way of the light in order to create a dark spot. But if we are talking about God declaring light over creation, there is no hidden spot before God. There is no part of that creation that is going to hide from the light. I hope you are, you're getting what I'm saying. God says, let there be light, and there was light. How come God still had to divide the light from the darkness? Why was there an existence of darkness in an expanse or in an area that God has declared light? You turn on the light in your room and the bulb begins to struggle with the darkness. Half of the room is dark and half of the room, and you successfully divide one source of light in the same space and you successfully divide light from darkness. I would like you to, 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 to imagine that, you know, because some people might think that when God said, let there be light, it's because he wanted to see. This is not what the Bible is talking about when the Bible says, and there was darkness on the face of the deep. Of course, there was darkness. Of course, the sun had hidden its light. The Bible in the book of Jeremiah tells us that God had commanded the sun to withhold its light. On the stars, he sealed them up. And this is what formed what we know today through science, our lower level of understanding as the ice age. Okay, so the ice age was as a result of commands that God gave to certain elements. Okay. Let me read that to you again. Genesis 1 verse 1 to 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Again, when you read further down, you go down to verse 14, you realize that God puts the stars, the sun, the moon, the lights, basically, that provide light to the earth, that divide our days and our seasons. God placed them later on. So we know that when God said, let there be light, he's not referring to the sun. Neither is he commanding the stars or the moon to give their light to earth. When God is talking about light, and the presence of darkness on the face of the deep. And God is also talking about dividing light from darkness. There are different levels of light and different levels of darkness. One word can transcend into many meanings and can be applied multiple times. So when we say, and God said, let there be light, we're referring to number one, light defines 
So you get into a room, you keep bumping into things, your toes are sore because you've been hitting tables and chairs because you can't see, because it's dark. So the room is undefined. Because it's undefined, you have no clear path to walk. Jesus said, when the light of this world goes dark, the sun, men stumble because they have no light in them. So when you enter a dark room, there is no definition. So for starters, there was darkness upon the face of the deep because the Bible does say that the earth was formless and void. It means there was no definition on earth. There was no, nothing was defined on earth. It was a pow of rubbish. And God said, let there be light. I told you we can transcend into many meanings with one word. So we are going to give the different descriptions of what light could mean and what darkness could mean. So when darkness was on the face of the deep, we've already been told that the earth was without form and void. So there is no definition on the earth. And then you can go to a, a higher level of the meaning of the word darkness, which would be a lack of the presence of information. Um, I'll use this term very loosely and for lack of a better term, really, our languages are limited, but earth and creation operate by an operating system, a software, okay? Loosely, lack of a better term. God is the operating system. He's a software. He is the one from whom all things came. And because all things came from him, they operate by him. There is an element of God, the likeness of God, that operates in all of creation. That is why Moses in the book of Exodus calls him the God of the spirits of all flesh. Because all flesh operates by God. So the light, the information that tells your blood not to flow from this point to that point, but instead to flow from this point to that point, the information that tells the sun where to direct its light and the earth how to rotate and the seas where to end, the boundaries thereof, and all this information that is within creation, that the trees should emit oxygen and consume carbon dioxide, uh, knowledge which greatly benefited us when we were in school because we, we told our parents that photosynthesis was uh, equipment we needed to buy. But if you understand what I'm trying to tell you, I'm talking about darkness being the absence of information by which creation operates. And when you take away this, everything implodes, everything explodes, everything collides. We're talking about catastrophe and chaos. The earth was formless and void because information had been taken away. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. We have established that when God was in this account of Genesis, God was not creating earth because the Bible says, and the earth was. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, okay? The Bible in the book of Job tells us that God stretched forth the earth, that he took a compass, he did measurements, that he suspended it in the air. The book of Isaiah tells us how he did all those things and the angels were clapping and rejoicing as God was doing that. Yet, the Bible here is telling us Okay, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Then verse 2 tells us, and the earth was formless and void. It seems there's something that happened. Between verse 1 and verse 2, the creation of earth and the earth becoming formless and void. There's something that happened because this is not the description of earth when God created it. When you read the book of Job, you read the book of Isaiah. Something happened for the earth to become formless and void. God called back his information, and everything became chaos. Now, when God says, let there be light, you will begin to notice that the rest of what God did was simple commands like, earth, bring forth animals. And the earth knew what animals were, and it brought forth animals that were alive and breathing. If God decided to make man with that same method, then we would not be in his image and likeness or rather in his image and according to his likeness. If God commanded the earth to bring forth man, but what God instead did was he formed man with his hands 
and he gave him the life. So the life of man does not come from the earth as that of beasts and trees. Trees and animals derive their life from the earth because the earth has a spirit. But man came from God and he's been clothed with earth. I hope this is sinking and I hope this is getting somewhere. So we're talking about the lack of the presence of information. The, we can transcend further in the meaning of light and darkness, light being God himself, so the light of the presence of God. Now let's put this all together and describe exactly what's going on here. So I'll read that one last time. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to 5. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. But the important thing is that God divided the light from the darkness. At this point, we have elements within creation. This is why it does not necessarily make sense to say this is physical light for God to see then he divided it. At this point, God had divided creation into two sections, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. So the kingdom of light becomes the parts, the elements, the section, the regions of creation that are covered within God. They share in his knowledge and his light. So because we share in God's knowledge, God's light is in us, we automatically, we don't need to go to God and ask him, Lord, what is your will? We automatically do according to his will. So our life is good. All things are good because the Bible says God is good. Ha! Blessed be the name of the Lord forevermore. You have no idea. Oh, God is good. So listen to this. Oh, God is good. If the light of God is in creation, then all things are good. Then there is a section, regions. The Bible, Jesus refers to these regions as outer darkness. They shall be cast out into outer darkness. Those regions that lack the light of God, the information of God, the operating system, the software. They operate by whatever else has filled them. For example, Satan has been filled with lies. He's been filled with pride. He's been filled with sin. Therefore, he has become the father of the manifestation of all lies because he was emptied of the light of God and filled with sin. So we're not talking about uh, someone who can repent. That software to repent is not in him. Okay? The book of Romans tells us what leads men to repentance. It's the goodness of God, the nature of God. So God divided the light from the, light from the darkness, which is the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Because at this point, those establishments had been made. And now the kingdom of darkness that was once a part of God's light begins to now try to pull down those that are in the light to bring them into, light, into darkness. This is why we see that God would walk with Adam in the core of the day in, in, the, in the garden. And God helped him in the process of naming the animals because they had a close relationship, God and Adam. And he was the source of Adam's information. God was the source because Adam dwelt in light. But Satan understood natural elements and he decided to distract Adam, to change the source of Adam's information from light to trees. And so Adam became a part of darkness. Oh, glory to God. At this point, everything that had been left within darkness began to experience 
the mystery of God. Because at this point, the revelation of God was hidden. That revelation of God that is within his light, that was commanded into creation, by which creation could operate, that light had been taken away and God became a mystery. And so man had to seek God again through sacrifices, through prayers, through the building of temples. There was no temple in the Garden of Eden. Neither will there be a temple in the world to come. Because the Bible says God will be tabernacled with them. So the need for temples and, and, and all these infrastructures and all these systems came in because God now became a mystery and man had to seek God. <laughs> oh, wow, 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 wow. I'd like to show you something. Uh, John chapter 1 verse 15. Sorry, John chapter 1 verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So do you see this? The Bible here is now describing the state of man, that man dwelt in darkness. Those that dwelt in darkness have seen a great light. Light shined in the darkness. This is talking about Jesus Christ. How Jesus Christ came to save man because man had fallen from the light of God. And so Jesus had to come into the darkness. But notice how the light of Christ did not expand the darkness. The darkness was not done away with. Because the existence of darkness is not necessarily the way you would understand it as light and darkness due to a bulb or electricity or the sun. It's the existence of information. There is knowledge within God. The knowledge of God's nature, the triune nature of God is a mystery. Oh, God is good. God is good. God is good. So Christ came to bring that light. I'll read you one last scripture and we'll, we'll look further into the mystery and when the mystery will come to an end. In part two, Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Now, I'll leave you with this scripture because this is where I would like to begin next week. The mystery of God was a consequence of disobedience. But the revelation of the mystery, when the mystery is revealed, this is our inheritance. Because the Bible says, hidden things are for God, but those things which are revealed are for you and your children. Heritage, inheritance. So we inherit them from our father and pass them on to our children. So one might wonder, all right, if we are living in the mystery of God, why then do we even need to investigate it to begin with? Uh, and is it, po is it possible to search God out now that God is a mystery? Of course, he reveals secrets to us. And the Bible says, the secret things are for the Lord, but what has been revealed to you is for you and your children. So number one, to begin to access the mysteries of God, you need to understand that there should be a revelation. And you also need to understand that there is a revealer of the mystery, the Holy Spirit. And you also need to understand that there is a reason why the revealer will reveal the mystery. It's because it's your heritage. And so we are going to start from there. The book of Ephesians tells us that the Holy Spirit is there guarantee of our inheritance, the down payment of our inheritance. And one day the knowledge of God shall be complete within us. We shall be perfected in God when we receive our new bodies. But for now, we can access knowledge in our, knowledge in our spirits by the Holy Spirit. If you're not subscribed, please do subscribe, hit the bell and share. I'm so glad to be here and I'll definitely be here next week uh, with you guys doing a part two of the mystery of God because this is a foundational subject that must begin to usher you into other areas of the knowledge of God. I know you have been blessed. I have been blessed too and I will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.
Hey, like what you see? I know you do. Hit the button below to subscribe and don't forget to hit the notification bell. Ciao.